the participant count has plateaued now. So yeah, I think we could start. Um, so so welcome all uh, to uh, the West of Scotland Safe Haven workshop. Um, we have a mixed audience. I think we have people uh, who are seasoned Safe Haven users and those who have never heard of Safe Haven. Um, so this workshop was designed uh, to update and inform of the great progress that uh, has been made in both the acquisition and provisioning of health data in a trusted research environment for research. Um, we have a series of talks today describing the safe haven, the data available, data access procedures, analysis platforms available, and showcase a few ongoing and planned projects. Progress. Sorry. So I, I will just ask Charlie Mayer, our safe haven manager, to kick off with an introduction. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Sandosh. It's nice to see lots and lots of people here. Um, but a bit of a presentation, so I'll just share my screen right now. Can you see that okay, Sandosh? Is that, am I live? Yep. Perfect. Good. All right, then. Well, um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes now, just give you a sort of very uh, brief overview of what the safe haven is and some of the services that we offer and um, a little bit of uh, an overview of some of the data um, that is available. Um, we're all, those of us who work in the safe haven, um, there's myself, we've got a project manager, four data managers and a couple of data analysts. Um, but we're all NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde um, employees, okay? And we're all handling um, identifiable um, patient data being pulled either from operational systems in the hospital, so usually secondary care data, or um, we're getting um, audit style reported data. So stuff that's gone to information services division um, Public Health Scotland, and then is returned to the health board. Um, so it's all chi linked, all identifiable, um, and we pseudonymize it and then um, reshare it, usually on the analytics platform at the RCB, um, for researchers like yourselves to do interesting um, and cool things with. Um, we work with you, um, we'll spec your project, we'll provide you with an environment to work in. Um, when you finish doing your analysis, we'll check your outputs from the platform as well. Um, we do disclosure checks on those. So um, really what we're offering is a kind of virtual space um, and end to end, <clears throat> we're securing the patient data. Um, we're providing you with a safe place to analyze the data. And then when you're outputting the data at the end as well, um, we're making sure that there's at no point any disclosure risk to the patients. Um, and as you're probably all well aware, there are acute sensitivities around using um, NHS data, patient data for research purposes, but it is um, legitimate under GDPR. Scotland is a little way ahead of England um, in terms of safe havens, trusted research environments and providing data. But during COVID, that gap has certainly closed. So um, that might come out in the Q&A session, but what's happening south of the border versus what we do um, here in Scotland is interesting to look at. Um, I won't go into too much detail really about the kind of um, logic of the safe haven. Um, you know, it's been around since 2012. Um, there's lots of different sort of terminology around safe havens, trusted research environments, you know, what is it, what makes up a trusted research environment? Um, but for here, I mean, I just think of it as a stack of services and technology. So we've got uh, servers, kit hosting all the data on the NHS side. We've got the data itself, metadata, catalogs, queries and searches that we're running to extract data. We've got the analytics layer. So we've got um, the RCB platform, we've got tools, software on there for analyzing the data. And then wrapped all around that is identity, authentication, security as well to kind of keep all of the data safe. 
Um, so um, when people ask us, you know, what is the safe haven? Uh, really, it's a set of processes. Uh, it's the data itself. Um, and it's bits of technology to allow you to get into the data um, and analyze and actually make, make use of it as well. Um, very briefly, there's four regional safe havens in Scotland. You've got um, Glasgow, Edinburgh, um, Aberdeen and, and um, Dundee as well. Um, that's incorrect. We've been live since uh, 2012. So um, been around for nearly 10 years now. Um, as mentioned, we've got seven staff getting another data manager next month for 2021. Thus far, we've had 46 projects and feasibilities. We've got 184 data sets registered to our database. Some are live, some are retired now. Um, we can link to over 2 million um, patient, unique patients in Glasgow. So that's the living population of about 1.3 million um, and deceased patients as well. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about the sort of scale of data that we do have available, um, but just a quick row count across 11 of our sort of most popular data sets um, gives a number. I'm not even gonna try and read out the number, but it's something, something billions of rows of data. So um, we're a very well populated resource and we can link to other sources of data um, if we need to as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I've put this slide in here because we do need to continue to always be mindful of, of patient privacy. Um, you know, we, we, we do have a purpose, a legitimate use under GDPR. All the projects are insulated from each other. We're always reviewing um, uh, risks, potential risks for re revealing identities of patients. And at the moment, we're doing quite a bit of work around disclosure controls for AI models, machine learning, um, inference attacks, um, you know, can models encode patient data and things like that. So it's really just to be mindful that the, the political and social climate can change um, on, a, on a bad news day. Um, and um, data lock in Edinburgh, um, had a lot of bad press a few months ago um, about its efforts to link to GP data. So I think um, in Glasgow, we just take a very cautious approach. Uh, we, we, we're supporting projects in the safe haven, but we, we, we're always, always, always mindful of patient privacy. We do not want to compromise that. So um, that said, we're a service really. So um, we offer um, feasibility studies, you know, people setting up clinical trials, you want to count how many patients there might be, we can help with that. We offer full data project end-to-end -end service. So from an initial idea through to your um, ethical approval, which um, Alison and, and Malcolm will talk about um, in just a moment. Um, we support clinical trials, um, recruitment, cohort design. Uh, we can import data to our data warehouse. So we're we can extract esoteric data from backend systems and the NHS or from other sources and clean it and bring it into our environment. Uh, we work quite closely with the biorepository also at the health board. So some of you here have probably run biorepository projects. They've got access to tissue, um, blocks, pathology samples. So we can um, link to um, Onkai to patient records as well. Um, and there's several very large scale um, projects that are in, um, in the pipeline right now, which Sandosh and colleagues will be well aware of that are looking at tissue, looking at samples, looking at omic data and bringing it all together into one place to do interesting things with it. Um, a lot of talk at the moment, can't really talk about data, about talking about AI. Um, we've got environments to support um, new models, validation of models, training of models, um, and there's efforts to um, federate access to other safe haven data. So if you develop a model in Glasgow, um, we're trying to facilitate you getting access to that data in Grampian. Um, so in the Q&A Q session, I'm happy to talk a little bit about um, the ICAD program and within that shape, which is the safe haven AI platform, which has lots of tools and tech to support AI model development. So this is really just a whistle-stop tour through what the Safe Haven has and what it can do. As mentioned, 
Um, we've got, you know, about, well, records for about one and a half million living patients, got um, records of patients that have deceased when registered at the health board. Um, we only link to health board registered patients. So um, we have some facility to link to um, other West of Scotland health boards. It's a little bit complicated. Again, we can talk about that in the Q&A session, but um, we do technically have access to some of the other West of Scotland Health Board data as well. Um, we've got different tiers of um, data. Um, tier one are general data sets. We've got general permission to link to those. We don't need to ask anybody else. Um, we just need to get a good LPAC ethical approval from our committee and then you can do a linkage project with those. Um, we have deposited data. So this is data um, sourced usually from other NHS systems or other projects. And if you want to link to that, we'll put you in contact with usually the data owner, data controller. You can show them your project proposal and they'll either say yay or nay. Um, and we've also got project specific data that we've brought in just for particular projects, but we've archived and backed up in the safe haven as well. Um, there's fewer of those, but basically if you want to bring your own data in and it's chi linked, you want us to chi seed it, we can bring it in, link it, uh, and it can form part of a safe haven um, project as well. Um, I mean, as mentioned, you know, there are limitations. We don't have access to all of the data in Scotland. It's only GGC registered patients. So it can get kind of, kind of complicated when we're building cohorts and people want um, you know, uh, data for say hospital attendances, if people are attending from outside of our health board, um, we won't have data from people from out in the Western Isles, or, no, sorry, out in the, the Highlands or something like that. Um, everything's linked on CHI. So um, if you're bringing in data sets, you've got data which doesn't have CHI, we'll try and seed it. Um, but again, you know, um, you know, for example, we had um, a data set of uh, childhood questionnaires conducted in Glasgow over about 10 years, 77,000 unique records. By the time we'd actually seeded it, uh, we'd lost about half of the um, study population just from people moving away and things like that. So um, it's just something to bear in mind. All the data is pseudonymized. So you, you don't get to see who the real people are and you're not allowed to try and guess who they are. Um, all the data is hosted in the Safe Haven analytics environment at the Robertson Center. So there's rules about how you access it, but times have changed. You can VPN in, you can customize the environment. So it's actually quite a flexible environment to work in. Um, and RCB shortly are going to talk a little bit about what they offer and what you can do in the environment, but I think uh, historically, the environments are a bit limited for the safe haven, but we've really, you know, moved on um, and can provide all sorts of tools that you need for doing good data science. Um, you can only use the data that you have ethical permission for. All right. So it's, I'm sort of stating the obvious here, but we have a process by which you apply to our local privacy committee and they say, yes, that's OK. You can do that, that, that linkage. Um, and um, cohorts, as mentioned before, registered patients to the health board change over time. So if you're doing a study and you want to do a long-term follow-up of your cohort five years later, 10 years later, um, at the moment, you just need to bear in mind there might be some attrition to your cohort. Um, so don't gasp as though I'm suddenly showing identifiable data here. This is um, a synthetic data set, but this is just an example of the sort of data that you'll get from us. We usually deliver in flat files, CSVs, the Robertson platform. Um, this here is um, Scottish Morbidity Record um, 01. So these are hospital attendances. And um, on the left far column, you can probably just make out, we replace all of the CHIs with safe haven IDs. All right. So this is what data looks like when you get it from us, but it will number in the thousands of rows hundreds of thousands of rows, you know, for some of these big COVID projects we were doing with, you know, um, Jill et al, you know, you've got millions of rows of data. Um, and just very briefly, you know, this is an example of how much data we've got for one data set. So these are SMR01 records. You can see the number of records, 
number of unique patients. And we've got data going back 10, 20 years. And we've got um, you know, hundreds of thousands of records for people coming in um, as general acute patients. And this is just one of the data sets. So we've got lots and lots and lots and lots of data that's available. Um, again, another data set here, labs data. Um, we've got a full view of SkyStore here at the health board. So we've got all of the laboratory testing, uh, biochemistry, hematology, radiology requests, COVID testing, that sort of thing. Um, and again, you know, we can kind of profile the data. Um, we've got data, you know, for, for labs data going back, decent coverage to about 2009. And you've got millions and millions and millions of, of, of records for every year that you can link to all sorts of other interesting data sets as well. Just very, I mean, this is really, really like a whistle-stop tour, um, but recent interesting stuff that we've linked in the safe haven, this is just in the last year. Um, we've got um, ICU, ITU data, we've got um, renal data sets, COVID testing. Um, Glasgow's unusual for the safe havens because we've got access to the vaccination data. So we've got a, a, an overnight stream of that. So with special permission, we can link to that. We're seeing test and protect data, sequencing data for Emma Thompson's um, project, Evade. Um, we've recently seen um, identical drug death data, so quite topical. Um, but these are annual, annual register of drug deaths in Scotland. But yeah, we're doing a project where we're linking to everyone that's on that list for Glasgow. Uh, we've seen police data on people being naughty under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Um, interesting stuff like um, new apps deployed in the hospital, COVID bedside assessment app that David might mention um, shortly. Um, interesting stuff about um, operative assessments. So before you have an operation, you know, huge data set of, of, of interesting um, attributes and things that have been noted um, and other stuff as well when we're beginning to cross over into social care as well. Um, and we can talk about that in the Q&A session, but yeah, we're trying to build, um, build some bridges with Glasgow City Council as well, which is kind of unusual for the safe havens, but trying to link across health and social care as well. Um, so just to sort of wrap things up for this little bit here, we've got a mix of data, we've got audit data, operational data, systems data, um, We've got documentation, metadata catalogs. Some of the data sets are big, all right? So when you're mm. doing your application to us, we will sometimes discuss with you, okay, you know, how much data can you work with? Um, but yeah, Robertson can provide a lot of compute power now. Um, and Sanders will probably mention that a little bit later on. If you want to work with big data, you can do it in Glasgow. Um, and I suppose the, the caveat to all of the safe haven data is that most of the stuff we've got is secondary care data, hospital data. Um, we don't have very much in the way of primary care data. Data lock in um, Edinburgh does, but um, there's been some controversy about their access to that. So that's just something to bear in mind is that we've got, we're, we're very heavily skewed towards secondary, secondary care data. And, you know, it's always worth bearing in mind bias in the data as well. So if you're only working with secondary care data, um, again, we can sort of discuss that later, but the stuff in the news today about new um, Department for Health AI led projects trying to explore bias in health data and health services as well. So this is always something to bear in mind. We're skewed towards secondary care, um, but other than that, We've got plenty of data, uh, lots of resources. So it'd be interesting just to yeah, spend a little bit of time this afternoon kind of going through um, what's available um, and get the chance to quiz us a little bit later on as well. So Sandosh, that's me for now, yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, the next, uh, so, so that is a good overview of what Safe Haven has. Uh, the next talk is how to get the data. So that's Alison and Malcolm applying for NELPAC approval. There we go.
Can you all see that? All okay. right. Yep. I, I know. I'm on okay. a MacBook, so sometimes it's a little bit finicky. Um, so uh, I'm Alison. Uh, contrary to what my name says, there's an L in there. I accidentally typed it wrong in my hurry to get one. Uh, I'm the Safe Haven Project Manager, and I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle stop tour as to how to access the Safe Haven. So, of course, it's not working. Yeah, there we go. So, whether you've used this for months, um, last sort of couple of years since Charlie and myself joined, I suppose we've changed things a little bit. So anything you want to know, the main steps include pre-application, application, the LPAC review, and the post-approval stage. So thinking about the pre-application step, if you've worked with us before, great, you know how to reach us. If you haven't and you're not sure if you can work with us or if we can support your project, I'd encourage you to reach out anyway uh the best people box itself charlie's or mine in your email if you've never worked with us before introduce yourself um give us a little bit of an overview about what it is you're hoping to achieve any any real crucial information so maybe you have a grant deadline or maybe you have a phd debt um endpoint coming up Anything that just to give us a little bit of a feel for what it is you're looking to do and what times we have to work within. Um, in the last year in particular, everyone who reaches out to us, we typically try and offer them a Teams or Zoom call so that they can have a chat and we can discuss the project. It gives you an opportunity to explain your project like I'm five so that I can get a really good grasp of what it is you want to do gives us an opportunity to discuss your cohorts and your data needs. Maybe you don't know your way around our data. So if you tell us what it is you're looking to achieve, we can tell you if we have the kind of data you would need to support that. If you have a cohort in mind, but you need us to build it and you're not sure what the numbers are, give us a bit of a description and we can run a feasibility check where I would get one of our analysts to take whatever criteria you want, go and get me a number. And then I say, right, this, this is the number of patients we have meeting that criteria. Do you want to go ahead? You say yes or no. Great. So if we've got it through the pre-application stage and we decide we want to progress, we will move on to applying to the safe haven. So we do not keep the applications on our website. You will get them typically from either myself or Charlie um what we like to do is we would get you guys to fill out the application form send it back charlie or myself will review it sometimes both and we'll send you back some feedback any questions we might have maybe suggestions for data sets you haven't thought of that might be good for your project or highlight anything we think we really can't support um with that in mind in the last year i think it is we've updated our application form um it looks a little bit different from the one we had even way back in the beginning of the safe haven. So I'm going to highlight a couple of fields in our application that seems to trip researchers up where they're not quite sure how to go about handling it. So this one's going to be surprising because we all love to talk about our projects. So you would think this would trip no one up. It trips a lot of people up because people aren't sure how much detail to go into. So it's not as in depth as say a grant application or a rec application. It's a lot more concise. I would say think of it as a bit like an abstract. We want a base uh, informative overview of what it is you want to do. Um, I've highlighted a few sections here, the project short name, the workspace. So do try and keep that to three words or less. Uh, project aims and objectives. You could give a couple of lines background to your project, but then really tell us what, what are your aims? What are your objectives? What is it you want to do? The lay summary should be accessible to anyone. So if you've ever written a grant, you've probably had to write, it, write a lay summary. If you've never had to do this before, think about explaining to a friend who has nothing to do with your field, how can you explain the project adequately to them? Last but not least is the project design and methods. A lot of people really don't include any detail here. And um, I think it's, it's really important that you do because this really allows us to tie to your aims and objectives. Is your methods really appropriate for what it is you're proposing to do? And is what you're proposing to do feasible? 
So um, moving on from here, we come to the cohort. So probably the, un the most crucial element of your application from purely the safe haven perspective in terms of delivering your project is the cohort. Your cohort is going to underpin your entire data set. So there's a couple of approaches to this. You can supply your cohort, um, you can give us a chi list, or you can give us some information and we can chi seed, um, or we can build it for you. If we're building it for you, we really need you to be as clear as you possibly can about what your needs are. So what are your inclusion criteria and what are your exclusion criteria? So think things like age, diagnosis, maybe there's a prescription you're interested in that usually you know, comes before diagnosis. What is your exclusion criteria? Typically things like age or a death record before, before the period of interest. Um, once you've spelled out your cohort, you'll move on to the data sets section. And this section is about as important as the cohort section, at least from the safe haven perspective, because this is where you tell us what it is you would like us to link to. Um, our data set portion of the application is really broken down into three major parts. There's the main data. So this is data sets that are commonly asked for. Of course, you don't have to ask for all of them or indeed any of them, but these are ones that almost everybody asks for at least one or more of. Uh, other data, if you go on our website, you can see that we have a lot of data sets. Um, I will say that that can be a little overwhelming and I would highly recommend that you talk to me or Charlie about before you request these data sets, because that way we can guide you to which ones are more pro most appropriate for your project needs, which ones are up to date. Um, but this section, so things like we have a comorbidities index, we have ethnicity index or index matrix um, that you might find beneficial. So do put them in the other data. Charlie mentioned tier three data sets. So this is the data import section on this application where you're not really depositing it to the safe haven beyond for this specific project. Um, the filters section, this is if, while we do apply default views to most of our safe haven held data sets, there may be specific things you want us to pull out. So use the filter section to specify anything you particularly want, or if it's maybe the only thing you want. Last but not least is the date ranges. So this is the time period with which you want your data to cover. So some researchers will want a fixed period. So say their cohort was recruited in 2020, they simply want three years worth of data for that for, from that time period. Uh, some people use an index event. So think something like a diagnosis could be the index event. And some researchers would want from index event to present or from index event plus or minus however many years. So do be clear because we need this when we are constructing our queries to extract your data. The next section that a lot of people really don't tell us an awful lot in is the analytics requirement. As you heard from Charlie, most of our projects are hosted in a secure analytical platform hosted by the RCB. And unlike your laptop, if you're missing some software, you can't just go and download it. Um, you would need to go back and request that the RCB install it. They're very busy people, so it might not be an instantaneous thing. So we would encourage you to be as detailed as you can in your analytics requirements. So specify what types of software you need, what uh, version you need. It also allows us to run it past the RCB so that they can flag any challenges we may have in, in providing exactly what you need. Okay, so when we get through the application and we're all happy and we know what we want, we get onto the LPAC review stage and as Charlie mentioned, we have the LPAC chair, Malcolm. So I'm actually going to circle back to this rather than dwell on it, because I'm going to let Al Malcolm talk from, about the LPAC from his perspective. But really, the LPAC are our ethics committee. Um, it is their job to scrutinize your application and make sure that it is suitable use of patient data. So assuming all goes well with the LPAC and you get your project approved, what, what happens post-approval? 
So increasingly in the last year, we started doing this. So, so from, the, from the beginning of the safe haven, we've always drafted a specification document. But what we now do is when we draft the specification document, we'll typically send it to yourself. So the specific, this document we craft based on your application and our discussions with you. So we'll include the cohort criteria as we showed you from the application stage, so what's included, excluded. This specification is an example one for a reference data set we currently hold um, it for unscheduled care. So we include things like people are in the NHS GGC area or health board. They are a resident of Glasgow City Council and something things like that. From the data sets component of your application, we will fill in the fields. Um, and then for description, that is the view that we're going to use within the safe haven. We'll specify if there's any filters and we'll include the date range. And what we do is we send this sheet to you guys um, and we'll ask you to say, is this what you're expecting? And if it is, great, we go ahead, we build the course what we need to change. So once we've your specification finalized, as I said, we do the extract. Once the data is extracted, we get a different analyst to quality check it and just make sure there are no mistakes. They will check against both the spec and the application to make sure we're delivering what's been agreed to. And they will also make sure that we have not accidentally tried to supply you with any patient identifiable information. And from there, we will upload it to the workspace. While all that's been going on, I will be starting to talk to the RCB team to set up your workspace. And what I will do is I will email you asking for a concrete list of who needs access. And I'll also be requesting your MRC research, GDPR and confidentiality certification. And even if you've done 10 projects with us, I'm still going to ask. This allows me to ensure that your certification is up to date and that I do actually have sight of it. So what's our typical timeline? It can be anything from a month to about three months from you contact us to delivery. It's very, very much dependent on everybody's availability and on the complexity of the project. So the pre-application stage, we can take up to two weeks. This is to allow us time to set up time to chat and discuss the needs of the project, run any feasibility checks. The application stage similarly is around two weeks. Um, and this is to allow us for the back and forth and to make sure the application is in an acceptable form. Um, the LPAC review, once I send it to the LPAC, um, they typically have one to two weeks to send back a response. Um, sometimes they will send questions. So usually what I do is I will email you before I submit or on the day I've submitted to say, hey, I've sent your LPAC or your application to the LPAC. So keep an eye out from there because either I'll be sending you an approval document or I'll be sending you a question. Sometimes the LPAC come to me with questions. If I can answer them for you, I will. If I can't, I'll put them to you. Last but not least is the data provision. So that can take two to six weeks. It really depends on how complex it is. If it's a simple extract, it's probably two weeks. If we're super busy, it might be longer. If it's really complicated, if we have a lot of refreshes or data imports, it can take longer. So it's really, really project dependent. Um, with that said, I'm going to hand over to Malcolm, who can give us a little bit more information about the LPAC. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully, uh, I've had some trouble with the audio from Alison. I don't know if that's because my internet connection is unstable, which I was warned about. So if I suddenly disappear, then that's the reason. Um, but it may be that there's still quite a lot of people, I think, who are unmuted on the on the screen. So it's useful for everybody, everybody muted if you're not actually speaking. Uh, the the LPAC uh, is operates as you, I'm sure, gathered from the fact that we endeavour to meet a two week deadline as a essentially as a virtual committee, and it's made up of active researchers, senior clinicians informatics specialists, information governance specialists, and um, most importantly, there's lay representation on the committee. 
you can see on the screen in front of you what is the questions that we endeavor to, to answer when we are looking at one of your applications. And the vast majority of applications go through very smoothly because of the, uh, the assistance and help and diligence in completing the form that occurs at the stage prior to LPAC seeing the form. So in order to allow us to meet our deadline, then I would re-emphasize the fact that uh, you take advantage of the help that Alison and Charlie offer you and help with uh, filling the form and that you do fill in the form uh, diligently, particularly the section for the lay members, because um, although the vast majority of members are uh, NHS GGC employees, they don't all have a, a medical or scientific uh, background. And so it's really important that your lay summary is well and that it's written in, in simple language that makes it clear exactly what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Um, other things which sometimes cause problems, is, as, as has already been emphasised, is too much technical language or uh, abbreviations, which even for those of us who have a medical training can sometimes cause problems when it's assumed that a specialist um, abbreviation um, is well known, when in fact it may have another meaning for another specialty. So it's important that you follow the usual principles of using um, writing things out in full before using an abbreviation in your, in your application. The majority of the internal applications uh, go through very smoothly, as I said. Where uh, you may be asked some additional questions or where more information might be sought is where there's an external commercial um, organisation involved. These are the ones which sometimes take a little bit longer uh, because the committee obviously wants to make sure that the uh, very valuable uh, data that we have is being used for the right purposes and not for um, simply for financial gain, uh, which obviously there is a potential for. So if you're um, working in conjunction with a commercial body um, or there are other external applications, then we currently information is used as we um, um, it's important um, which I don't think Alton touched on is we're investing what's going to happen to results what this information is going to be you're going to use it and um, we're talking principally about research today the statement also uh, allows for quality assurance projects and so it's, it's useful to know what the, the um, end use of the results is going to be to help. There appears to be a problem with the audio. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it seems that uh, Malcolm is currently having technical issues. Um, I don't know if we want, should we give him so, a second to see if he comes back on or do you want to ask me some questions? Uh, I think we'll have question and answer session at the yeah, end. We will. So what we'll do is why don't we go move on to the next uh, session and uh, we can get Malcolm back later on. So, so the next session is the most uh, important one, which is you've got the data from Safe Haven and now you need to do the analysis. And that's where the RCB team comes in. So I'll hand over to the RCB team to tell us about the analytical platform that they provide. Hi there, uh, my name is Alan Stevenson. I am one of the senior um, IT members at the Robertson Center. Um, I'm head of the Safe Haven support team. Um, that works with Charlie and Alison, and I am just going to, hopefully we can see those slides coming up now. So yes, I'm a member of the, senior member of the IT team here at the Robertson Centre, hosting the analytical platform that Charlie and Alison have been kind of mentioning for the last while. Um, so what is the analytical platform? Well, essentially what we provide is a secure environment for accessing the unconsented routinely collected data that we've been discussing. Obviously it is unconsented data. Um, it has been pseudonymized, but we still need to be um, safe in how we handle that data to ensure um, there is no kind of breach or identification can occur with it. Um, 
Within the Robertson Centre, we are accredited to ISO 27001 for information security. So what that essentially means is um, in our typical work, we have a robust set of um, information security controls that we adhere to for all our work, which includes hosting the analytical platform. Um, the platform itself um, it essentially is just a way for you to access the data and it provides you with the tools you need to do the research. Um, so I've mentioned here a common and bespoke analysis tools. Um, so what that means is quite often the majority of our projects will be what we call more traditional statistical analysis um, historically. So it would be using R, SAS, SPSS, that kind of software, we would provide that. Um, however, where projects require it, um, we will provide essentially whatever software we can that has been asked for. So we'll build a bespoke environment and provide software based on the needs of the project. Um, so as I said, it is all about the robust controls and safeguards to ensure that sensitive data safety. Um, but it's also about what we have to provide as a way for you to get your results out of the platform um, once you've got to that stage. Um, so we also host a secure web portal, which facilitates um, the release of uh, any sort of summary reports or other work that you've been doing um, and that facilitates the disclosure control mechanism with the NHS team. Um, on site on the boy door for accessing the data, we do have a safe room, which sadly over the last sort of year or two, coming up on two now, has been closed due to COVID restrictions. Um, we'd hope to get that reopened at some point, but Obviously, next year, as part of the Institute move to the new Clarence Pears building, there's been some provision put in that building for new safe rooms. Um, however, what we've found traditionally is that the vast majority of projects are accessed via a secure VPN connection that we provide. So that allows researchers to use their own desktop machines, laptops, etc., um, to have a secure tunnel into the safe haven environment and access the data from the comfort of your own home, essentially. Um, and just as an aside, as part of our work hosting the analytical platform, we also sit on the um, working group for the Safe Haven, which you can think of the group that sort of like a management group that handles the kind of strategic directions and things like that for the Safe Haven. So we have a voice on that as well. Just briefly for people that don't know, the Robertson Centre, uh, we are part of the Institute of Health and Wellbeing. Um, we're founded in 1988, um, originally as part of the Department of Statistics before moving across to our current college um, and we are part of the Glasgow Clinical Trials Unit alongside NHS R&D and the Clinical Research Facility. Um, although we are part of a clinical trials unit and a lot of our work has been in clinical trials, we do have a strong history of working generally on research with both academics and commercial partners um, and that kind of put us quite well placed to work on this. We Essentially our, our business is supporting research one way or another, um, whether that has been through clinical trials or through enabling the Safe Haven platform, or even uh, we've been known to host teaching um, for uh, statistics and clinical trials and that kind of thing. So the centre has always had that kind of history of helping with research, and this has kind of been a natural extension of that. Um, platform usage, obviously, Charlie and Alison have covered some of the numbers already. Um, on our platform, we've hosted over 100 of the projects that have been mentioned earlier. Currently, um, we're looking at about half that number that we would call active projects that are in use with over 200 user accounts within those 50 um, projects. Um, so, it's, so it's a reasonably well used platform and has been over the years. And that's something we've seen a distinct uptick on over the last few years with more projects coming through um, and different kinds of projects. Obviously, I've got a small list here. We, we have dealt with commercial and academic projects, as we said previously. Um, but we've also been expanding our portfolio in terms of the types of project we support. While currently an awful lot are kind of based using R and things like that, we have done a lot more data science work, big data, um, machine learning, all of that kind of thing over the last year, that's really started to, to kind of come into the, the fray for us. So we've had to kind of expand and adapt to support these new kinds of projects that have come on board. So what do we provide within the platform environment? So we, first and foremost, um, as I say, the NHS will supply you your files in a sort of flat file CSV format. Um, so we will provide you with read-only access to those. Um, 
we'll give you a secure space in our file store that will work for you sharing and um, for you storing your working files and um, any analysis data sets, code files, etc. They'll all be securely stored and backed up on our file store. Additionally, if your project's got multiple researchers, there'll be a shared working area so that researchers can share code analysis data sets um, outputs within themselves without having to leave the, the safety of the safe haven environment just to co make collaboration that little bit easier. Um, as mentioned, we provide standard analysis tools. Again, our SAS SDSS I've mentioned already. Um, with the shift over the last year, with the kinds of project we're taking on and work we're doing, we're seeing a lot more requests for Python come through. Um, and on top of that, obviously, what we have to do a lot is um, support adding additional packages to these. You know, no one just uses vanilla R or vanilla Python. So we will work with researchers to ensure that they get access to Tidyverse or TensorFlow or whatever packages you might need to do the work you're looking to do. Um, help importing external files into the environment. What that essentially means is um, because it is a secure work area and because of restrictions in place as a result of that, what we've had in some cases is researchers will do some work outside of the platform, just producing some standard R libraries they want to use or some uh, look up code files, that kind of thing that they then want to be able to bring into the environment to run on the real data. We'll help get with that as a way for you to get your code into to the environment and run it on the real data. And finally, as mentioned, we'll help support you in getting any of your results out of the safe haven into your own hands out with the secure environment. That's, that's, so we help with that whole uh, part of the life cycle of the project. I've just seen the question pop up. Yes, there is Stata on the platform. I couldn't swear as to what version it is, but um, yes, we have supported Stata in the past. Um, <laughs> so um, what are the steps? So if, if you're a new researcher coming in, so as Alison was just talking about, obviously you'll have a, a process where you're working with Alison, that team, to go through your LPAC submission. Um, while we do sit on the working group, which who meet monthly, um, we also will have monthly meetings with Charlie and Alison routinely to discuss uh, any upcoming projects and the LPAC submissions, that kind of thing. So they will very much have a dialogue with us and keep us up to date on um, the, uh, the current goings on and what projects are likely to come up over the next few months. Um, Again, as Alison was mentioning, she'll have the dialogue with you as to what your specific requirements are and where they suspect there might be um, some needs to bespoke requirements for the platform, or if there's anything about the project that might be a bit unusual, so be it the type of data you're using or the size of the extract or the software you're using, they'll have a discussion with us about that. And where we feel necessary, we're very happy that we will get involved at that point and have um, conversations with researchers be it over email or Zoom, Teams, whatever is most convenient. We're keen to have those conversations to figure out exactly what your needs are and how we can help you to accomplish that goal within the platform. Um, whether it's software we can just install and get set up, whether it's something we might have to discuss with you about potential alternatives that would work within the environment, we're keen to have those discussions up front um, so that by the time you, you get access to your, your extract, you're good to go in your project. Um, and as I say, just the bottom line there, obviously one of the things we will also want to talk to you as well is depending on um, what you, you need within our project, we can discuss specific hardware requirements beyond the software. So we do have um, our, what we would term our standard desktop, but where you might have a larger extract or be able to do some particularly complex work, we can discuss higher levels of computational power being provided up to the point of providing you with access to GPU resource, which we now have for machine learning work. So the next step would be that um, you've talked to Alison and Charlie, you've got your LPAC approved. We'll get formal notification at that point from that team that this project is now to be set up on the platform. Um, that will include all the things Alison mentioned, so software requirements, uh, the researchers involved, all the rest of it. Um, where at that point we might come in is if we haven't spoken to you previously as researchers, um, we might get involved at that point so that we can um, discuss specific package requirements. So if it is an R-based project, obviously you don't want to come in and just load up 
just standard R and realize you can't progress your work for another three days or whatever and panic. No, we, we'll get in touch with you at that point, see what kind of R packages are you needing. We can get a list, we can make sure those packages are all preloaded into the environment for you. And again, you can hit the ground running. Well, what will then happen is you'll get signed through a standard VPN access form. It's just a disclaimer form. It's nothing too scary. And it just kind of covers the do's and don'ts on the, the platform, which to be honest, you'll have likely discussed with the NHS team anyway, prior to coming on board the safe haven. Um, and once all the paperwork signed off, the boring bits, then you'll get through your connection details, um, which will typically, as I mentioned before, will supply you with VPN instructions. You'll be able to install the VPN software, which is supported on Windows and Mac OS. I was asked earlier to make sure I pointed out we do support Apple Macs, not just uh, Windows, but um, you'll get sent through the connection details for setting that all up and that'll get you connected and onto the desktop. Once you log in, um, it's very dull to be honest. Um, what you'll see is something like this, a very standard Windows desktop. Um, you do get a boring disclaimer message, which um, again, we'll just go through some of the do's and don'ts, make sure you're it's only authorized access to the data, that kind of thing. Um, there's some helpful information there as well, just reminding you to get in touch about the outputs process, that sort of thing. But otherwise, what you can see is a fairly standard Windows desktop. There are shortcuts on the desktop here for accessing your read-only study data area. Um, there's a user where your user files would be saved, all just normal. Windows interaction. And you can see here kind of standard software, R, R Studio, uh, Stata, which was asked about earlier, is, is there on this demonstration, as well as Microsoft Office. And for this particular demonstration project, we can see we also supplied many tab, which wouldn't normally be in a project. So that's an example of where a non-standard piece of software has been built into an environment to allow people to do their work. So what restrictions are in place? The tricky part sometimes is researchers just want to get on with their research and unfortunately it is a secure environment. We have to ensure the data is kept safe so there are restrictions in place. So two of the big ones that I personally always run into are the fact that just as examples you can't copy and paste from outside the environment. You know copy and pasting is the most natural thing in the world to do and unfortunately we can't let people do it from out within break that wall between your PC and the environment. Once you're in the environment, you can certainly copy and paste between files as much as you want, but it's just to stop people going into Excel, selecting all the rows and then pasting it onto the local copy on their laptop. You can't do that. Um, similarly, there is no internet access. So I've spoken a lot about packages. Um, you won't be able to install them on your own due to the lack of internet access. They have to be requested through the support team. But what the big message here is we, at the end of the day, are about um, supporting the research and helping you to achieve your project, as trite as that may sound. Um, so while these restrictions are in place, we'll always try and work with researchers to make sure they can do their work around the restrictions. So the examples I would give here are the, uh, I mentioned previously about some researchers will work externally, produce some code files, lookups, et cetera. Then we'll work with you to bring it into the environment. And that saves the copy and paste issue that I mentioned. Or alternatively, in terms of packages, again, we'll often try and work as much upfront as we can with the research team to ensure that everything's installed before you come in. But real life and research are what they are. You'll never have everything you need. All you have to do is you email the support team we'll get your request for a package and that is something that will very typically be done within a few hours just to update your R install or Python or whatever it is um, with whatever new requirements you've got. Similarly, if there's an actual new piece of software that you suddenly require you need, you just have to get in touch. We would be able to pick up the discussion from there as to whether it's something we could easily provide, if there was any licensing concerns. Um, Again, it's very rare because when you come to specific software packages, we would usually have had that conversation up front, but it is not a done deal once you log into the environment. We're perfectly willing to have the conversation once your project's underway, if updates are required. Getting results, again, I've, I've, I've touched on this before. So we do provide a secure web portal. Um, Charlie and Alison have obviously mentioned disclosure control. Essentially, it's a very simple process. What you have to do is you get in touch with the support address again that would be provided to you. Um, we would make those files uh, available on the secure portal. It'll go to the NHS team first and you'll get a confirmation email just so that you know that the process is underway. And the NHS team will be able to do their disclosure control just to make sure there's no danger of 
any individuals being identified from the results that you're bringing out, which is typically very rare because usually it will be some sort of summary tables and things like that that are being produced. Um, so they will do their disclosure control. Um, we will, uh, they will then update, approve or reject the outputs based on that. You'll get an email notification with that. If files have been rejected, um, there should be a comment just giving you a rough idea of why. We can then certainly help facilitate the conversation with Alison and the team about um, how we get the files updated um, to ensure that you can then get them out again um, and everyone's happy. If they're accepted, then that's great. You just log in, download the files, and that's you. So that's roughly coming on board um, what you can expect from the safe haven as it is now. Over the next 12 months, um, we are looking to continue to expand. As I say, over the last year, we've seen some really different kinds of projects coming in. There's, you know, there's been some interesting challenges, shall we say, but you know, we've risen to those, we've supported them, and we've been very fortunate to receive some additional funding for hardware from the uh, college and the NHS, which have increased our storage capacity for larger extracts, our computation ability for using those larger extracts, and even down to purchase of GPU hardware to support the machine learning project. So we're seeing that expansion and the kinds of projects and the hardware support we need to um, coming in even over the last year. And we certainly see that continuing. And just finally, um, we're always looking for feedback. You know, if there's something that, if people have questions, if there's something people would like to know up front, you know, whether it is establishing requirements at the beginning of the project or um, talking to us about, um, you know, requirements, as the project is ongoing, or just afterwards, if you want to give us any feedback on it, we are always open to talk. And that's one of the big things that uh, we'd certainly like everyone to take away from this, is it's all about having a conversation with us at the end of the day. We are here to make sure people can use this NHS data to do their research. And that is, that is the bottom line for us at the end of the day. So we can have a conversation with researchers to improve what we're doing and to make more research um, possible. And make it easier and that's certainly something we would want to have a conversation about that's it thank you very much thank you alan um just to remind uh, the audience that we will uh, have a q and a session at the end and all the slides will be circulated uh, once we get permission from the speakers and there will also be a link to the recording uh, the next speaker is Professor David Lowe. He is a consultant emergency physician and has leadership roles within NHS innovation and digital health. And he's going to speak on disease cohorts and using routine data for recruitment. David. Perfect. Thank you very much, Santos. Let's pull up slides and make sure everybody can see them. Can everybody see those slides? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. So what I'm going to do is, I suppose, run through a little bit of how we currently use the West of Scotland Safe Haven, as well as sometimes with reference to EGIS, the National Safe Haven for delivery of projects, both within the West of Scotland Innovation Hub, work with the University of Glasgow and academic partners, as well as industry partners. So I'm going to go through some general principles and thoughts, and then some specifics around about projects that really show the scale, hopefully, of the opportunities both in terms of traditional research, and as Alan's already said, using traditional statistical approaches, as well as perhaps some of the more challenging work we're doing often with industry partners as we start to think about deployable AI decision support into the NHS, which is certainly challenges all about both infrastructure, governance, and general technical capability. So I'm a clinician, I'm an emergency physician, I'm going to be going in to do a back shift in the Queen Elizabeth is clearly being challenged at the moment. Um, as is the whole of the NHS and indeed worldwide due to pandemic and other issues around about comorbidity and frailty. We do, however, generate a huge amount of data and there's a huge opportunity to therefore leverage that data to improve the quality of care that we deliver to both patients and think about how we can improve general systems and clinical pathways. The data is in the walls quite literally, but it's actually able to extract that in a manner that allows us to be able to provide insights into the care pathways that are being delivered. And a theme through what I'm going to describe today is 
as Alison has already said, engaging clinicians, informaticians around about how the data is generated because there's some inherent biases within that that's worthwhile playing out as you think about how you're going to use NHS generated routinely collected data within your research projects or um, studies. I think it's already been highlighted that there's a huge opportunity here. It's 1.3 million patients. If you go out to the wider West of Scotland network, that's about 2.2. It's all routinely collected data within secondary care with some caveats around about how we do that. I think challenging now, the OECD has said actually Scottish data fluidity and access is amongst the fifth worst within their uh, federation worldwide. And that really is challenging us from a I suppose a, a government level, which is one of my roles within Scottish Health Innovation, uh, within Scottish government, but how we improve that. And the safe havens are critical to that process and equally challenging both as particularly um, academics, but also clinicians about how we use that data better, how we generate it and how we structure it in a way that can be leveraged uh, for both research and delivery of care. Cohorts, I think, are important. We work very hard with them in Safe Haven, and Charlie and I and Alison have spent some time developing some cohorts that are available to, um, to researchers and academics to actually use immediately almost off the shelf. And I think that's an initial opportunity really to start to look at those data sets and be able to say, does that answer the question already, which both reduces costs, potentially some of the hassle and, and challenges around it, defining a cohort, but also allows you to compare against other researchers doing work similar into that field. So things like prediction of mortality, readmission, length of stay, and those kind of operational predictions that allow you to benchmark the products of what you've done against other people who have already used that established data set. So the ones I'm specifically involved in that Charlie will be able to describe others that are available um, are around about COPD, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and linking both to routinely collected data, but then how we've systematically worked augmenting that both by using patient reported outcomes and increasing physiology to do that and while that still sits within a project dynamic it's about how do you if you want to kind of use that data approach the clinicians and the researchers using that data to potentially think about other opportunities to innovate and that's similar to heart failure we did a piece of work in the last year during covid and have collected um, a thousand people's structured clinical data pro data um, biomarker data in terms of traditional biochemistry work, but also imaging. So we've collected their echoes, both using a portable with a five Phillips device and a GE device. And that's available linked to ECG and ultimately outcome and diagnosis to be able to think about how you can use that data. And I'm going to go through how we've started to use that data to predict and case find those individuals in the population. Charlie's worked really hard around about Glasgow City and getting Glasgow City operational data as well to start to link. And we started to think about pollution data as well to be able to do that, to think about outcomes in, within the social care spectrum, and especially for those that are going to be putting in grant application. Otherwise, be able to demonstrate that linkage to outcomes beyond what's happening in the NHS, especially as you move to a kind of uh, care, national care service, as opposed to national health service, that's going to be increasingly important. And osteoporosis is another area we've built in a cohort around about to predict not only those that have uh, are likely at risk of developing osteoporosis, but equally thinking about how we can link that to those kind of sentinel conditions compared against traditional multiple regression models, um, such as FRAX, to identify those at risk and really start to think about how we can augment that current process and drive it into clinical practice. And there's a number of COVID sets that we've built together during this time that Kevin's going to talk about later around about Asterix, but linking both sequencing data that's been generated by the university, vaccination data, and with, with, with additive value around about ethnicity, because we've started to collect that in a really um, systematic way through vaccination process, because some of the considerations around about COVID risk. Um, as well as moving into thinking about when people come back into the hospital, um, there are tests based on point of care testing and their lab data, et cetera. So there's an opportunity there again with these established cohorts to think about how you could access them to start to generate hypothesis, to be able to demonstrate some work in progress when you're looking for further grant funding that reduces, I suppose, the friction around about um, that initial piece of work. 
Tier three data sets, I think Charlie's already touched on that, is important within this consideration. Certainly, most of the work that I do and our teams do is adding additional tier three data sets into Safe Haven for further and future linkage. SERPA is the one from uh, the dialysis team that's really important both to understand. And I think I'm going to pick up that theme a number of times around about if you're going to use data sets that you're not familiar with, there's some considerations around about that. The ITU SIGSAG data is another good example of understanding the completeness of that data. And the hobby horse of both myself and Malcolm as ED clinicians is understanding physiology generated from ED track care data. So understanding, for instance, all the critically unwell patients that get standby by into recess actually do not have physiological data recorded for them. So therefore that's missing data and any inferences you make based upon the lack of that data is intrinsically faulty. And that we've seen that through 4C and other projects that have taken routinely collected data, but not understanding the genesis of how it has been created. And additionally, we've done that with um, heart failure and COPD as we've described, and I'm sure Charlie will be able to provide other examples of tier three data that if you wish to use it, there's a question to be answered Then working in collaboration with an established um, group is clearly additive and can be an advantage. I think linkage opportunities are important. I'm going to touch a little bit on creating new data sources, which is often quite what we have to do, is be able to say, here's the core data that we already have, that therefore let's not replicate it. But equally, what do we need the clinician to enter now that's going to answer a research question? We've got a project about to start called Charisma um, within the Queen Elizabeth, which is adding routinely collected data around about characterizing patients presenting with COVID and or co-infection with bacterial or indeed influenza. There's MRC CLIMB, which Emma Thompson has very kindly facilitated for projects that there's a good justification for sequencing data within COVID. And I think there's always that kind of break glass moment um, of thinking about when you actually want to use a national data set. Do you do your initial piece of work within the west of Scotland and then look to generalise um, and validate within the rest of the UK, either using SAIL in Wales or Idris, as well as thinking about um, other linkage opportunities with NSS, for instance, with SPIRE and primary care data. And we're working pretty hard to be able to pool both the secondary care data that works well within uh, secondary care and combine that with SPIRE because that's very much a missing area at the moment to look for those opportunities. And data completeness, there's some known issues that once you put in a request and they'll often be highlighted. So get histograms to so look at potential missingness of data, especially if you're subject matter in that area. So if you look at for instance, ED hospitalizations, typically in our heads, we'd expect to see about 30 to 35% hospitalization from all cause attendance to the ED. If the data doesn't look like that, we know it's a systematic error or there's something else going on that we need to explain before you start to do the analysis. So if for as researchers or academics not familiar with the data you're getting, think about reaching out to a clinician, um, be it an ITU, renal, or whatever area you're working in, if you're going to use that data just to make sure it's sense checked before publication or before you do vast amounts of work. Ethnicity, we're practically thinking, and as I said, primary care, we're trying to sort. Methodology, now clearly I come from an ML AI background in terms of deployment of solutions, and as very much within the heterogeneous data generated within routinely collected data within secondary care, ML approaches will often be appropriate given missing this and the heterogeneity of the data, but again, it depends on the research question you're asking. And creation of those tier three data sets, the gap, how are you going to get clinicians to engage in that process? How do you fit it into clinical workflow? And have you got funding to do that? And then minimizing keying and linkage. So typically we work in collaboration either with industry partners, Canon, um, Storm ID, cohesion and others to be able to do that, to be able to create a tool for the clinician to engage with, to type additional data to link to CHI, because that's critical. But then there are other opportunities about minimizing keying by using NES or track or portal to be able to uh, and, and optimize those particular current existing patient management systems to gather further data. And Santos and I are putting in a project using the newly procured uh, in healthcare solution that collects PROs patients with blood pressure issues and thinking about how you can already leverage existing data collection tools that um, um, exist so you don't have that additional cost or challenge. I think it's already been touched on a little bit by Alan, but think about computing and storage requirements. 
how much data you're going to get. And the guys from Safe Haven will very quickly say if you're going to exceed the requirements around about that and the cost implications, especially as you're using big data. Integrations, especially if you're going to be deploying a solution into a clinical se um, setting, which is some of the work we're doing with COPD with an NHS X AI funded piece of work that think about what the implications of integration within statutory systems will be, both in terms of regulatory approval and otherwise. And what's the cadence of refresh? Is it just a single set of data you want to put into the Robertson? Or are you going to want it refreshed on a regular basis and be able to set that process up to do that? And what trusted research environment are you going to use? Is it going to be the Robertson or is it going to be some other uh, TRD that you've identified that gives you other capability, be it cloud-based technologies or otherwise? So a couple of projects just to define and describe what we've done. The first is with Jill Pell, which is around the COVID in Scotland study. And that's really the learning from the net, uh, National net, uh, Notification Service during COVID. So every time you've got a COVID test, you've got an SMS to tell you if you're positive or negative, which was provided as an opportunity to use that data to link it to the region. So this is a national safe haven. But then to be able to send out every positive D case controls that are negative based on sex age and uh, deprivation, ask them essentially EQ5 and severity of disease questions and be able to link that to outcome data. And again, that's an opportunity to be able to link to wider data sets, be it prescription data, uh, ITU, SIGSAG data, to be able to answer some fairly significant questions that you wouldn't be able to do without the Robertson um, uh, or the DHS in this case. So using a company, so Storm ID, to be able to create that data collection tool and going through the uh, quite labyrinthine steps around about information governance to be able to do that. And clearly, if you want to do that sort of size or scale of project, and probably talking early, certainly to the guys within Safe Haven, but also perhaps some of the learned experience that Jill and I have, we'd be happy to share around the process of how you augment and then link to national data sources. Heart failure, I've already touched on a little bit, and we did offer, which is an uh, optimized pathway for early heart failure recognition utilizing AI, which is funded by AstraZeneca. We got through sent to the backlog of patients in Glasgow, 12 month waiting list for heart failure diagnosis, but acquired echo imaging, which is why AZ funded us to do it, to validate an AI tool that would um, essentially auto report the sonographer's acquired images. But critically to that <coughs> approach, we gathered routinely collected data, so PROs um, as well, that were currently collected on paper, so therefore weren't digitized, and then thought about what other data we needed to do things around about both case findings, so predicting those at risk of developing heart failure in the next three to five years. How do we augment that by prioritizing referrals and that case finding approach? And then finally, how do we predict long-term outcomes? But we can do that now as a tier three data set because we've got essentially platinum based validated data that's being collected during the course of that study. And the outputs from that around about the case finding that are, I suppose, useful within this conversation. And it's being able to train an algorithm to be able to identify those individuals that are likely to develop heart failure so we can bring them in. So we used ED data, inpatient data, recognizing the heterogeneity of that, as well as outpatient medication and blood pressure data that was gathered. Now, clearly, that's pretty episodic as if they've been to a pre-op theatre clinic. And really, some of that missingness might drive you to be able to actually think before you actually um, do the final invites for an early diagnostic heart failure clinic, you'd actually want to ask the patient what's their recent blood pressure or provide them with a tool to do that or access primary data to improve the performance before you go out and start to plug people into an early diagnostic um, pathway to do things. We've just the standard uh, rock curves that everybody in this call will definitely be familiar with, but then start to think about how we operationalize that, which is really around about probability thresholds and being able to say what's acceptable to bring into a clinic, recognizing the number of false positives you're going to have within that control um, known population to do that. So an example of how we do using a tier three data set augmented by a process of collecting further data and then doing linkage to be able to start to improve a clinical pathway funded by AZ at this point, and then moving forward for other funding streams um, in, uh, in the next couple of months. And a similar approach with osteoporosis, how do we train using routinely collected data to identify those 
that have got a risk of osteoporosis. And I'm just going to introduce that idea of imaging biomarkers. So not just using routinely collected data, which is the, the S1 model, but how can you use routinely collected CTs in this case, an industry produced um, algorithm that identifies vertebral fracture, which is the sentinel feature of osteoporosis, and combine those two together to uplift performance. And again, using the expertise of Safe Haven to do that, being able to gather both clinical data um, and imaging data together, um, anonymize it, link it, provide it to two different companies to produce an outcome. And that, again, as Alison's described, building a cohort is important with that sort of feature. Um, and using eye care to do that. So eye care, working with Strength in Places uh, and the ICE um, location within the Queen Elizabeth campus to be able to essentially define a cohort, anonymize, put into safe, secure storage, and then provide linkage um, to a company via a set of APIs or um, by transfer to allow them to essentially analyze the data and produce an output against that. For instance, for the osteoporosis piece, it's just simply a binary outcome of vertebral fracture identified or not with a probabilistic score and a confidence in interval as we kind of explore and identify the opportunities of using that approach again in a case finding manner. And we've done that with chest x-ray as well. So working again through the eye care piece of work with Bearing, which is a industry partner based down in London, is to be able to train an algorithm that we've just published in Nature around about COVID, but equally around about labelling um, chest x-rays with a degree of accuracy that gives confidence to both the board, clinicians, and end users that actually we can identify normal in such a way that we can strip them out of the clinical care pathway do not need to be reported and provide decision support. And that's an ongoing piece of work as we seek to integrate AI um, into the path uh, into clinical care pathways. And critically for safe havens purposes, they've allowed us to identify those cohorts to be able to pull down 2.1 million chest secretaries to be able to do that and link to outcomes and using natural language processing to be able to label the chest x-rays based upon um, the radiology's radiologist historical routine reports. So not without complexity, as you can imagine. So I think my advice would be contact Safe Havens, ask for previous examples. Alison knows that I'm quite happy for any of the previous LPACs that we've submitted that don't have commercial confidence to be shared. Get informatics expertise to understand the data and where it's come from its genesis and clinical expertise as well, often is useful if it's an area you're not familiar with. And certainly if it's a data set you've not used before and not had those discussions. And data dictionaries, especially if you're gonna try and merge and work and do generalization work across multiple different sites, including the West of Scotland, think about how those align the quirks of the system, both in terms of simple things like pH, how it's recorded, is it, or is it pH or H plus ions, and therefore how are you going to be able to do the data cleaning, data factory work across multiple sites, especially if you're going to use a Robertson to do that, you're going to train and validate in one area, and then um, take it across and validate in a, a third to demonstrate generalizability. So I'll stop there, and that's a very quick run through, I suppose, a clinician academics experience, and I've unfortunately got to go um, to work. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, I'd be delighted to take them. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, David. Um, we are planning to have questions in the end, but if you, if there's anybody who has got any burning questions for David, I'm happy for you to ask now. I don't see any hands up. Thank you, David. Uh, so we'll move on to the next presentation. So it's back to Charlie on an annual review of uh, recent projects. Charlie. Okay, thanks, um, Sandosh. And thank, thanks, David, for um, that little whistle-stop whistle, whistle -stop tour through um, some of the, the recent projects um, that you've been involved in. Um, let me just pull up a few slides here. Uh, Okay. All right. Okay, can everybody see that there? Yeah. Yep. It's well, um, I thought we'd just spend 10 minutes or something like that, just sort of 
running through just some of the work that we've done in the last um, year or so, um, I'm still relatively new to the safe haven. I only joined um, in January 2020. Um, and then um, in by March, everything had got a little bit weird. So um, we um, had to quite quickly switch to um, remote working. Um, and, you know, really grateful to the the Robertson for being able to provide that 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 VPN access into the environment because it really allowed um, <clears throat> Glasgow to kind of pivot to supporting data driven research in response to the pandemic um, in a way that um, I think it's fair to say the other safe havens you know struggled to do that and I think a lot of organizations didn't find it straightforward switching that way but I think it was because we had that. Um, established relationship, that flow of, of data and processes from NHS to the, the environment that allowed us to kick off um, some really, really interesting COVID response projects um, in, in the first half of 2020. Um, I think it's also important to emphasize, and I just want to say thanks to all of the, the Safe Haven team and colleagues as well, because we really, as far as possible, did manage to try and continue business as usual, okay? We, we, we didn't shut up shop. Um, we continued to extract data, um, to run feasibility studies, um, and, and towards the end of the year, really try and um, support some of, that, some of those restart activities around clinical trials as well. So, um, yeah, I just really want to say thanks to my own team for all of the kind of the hard work that they've put in in, in what was an odd year and to, you know, RCB as well. Um, David's mentioned some of those um, big projects during the year, um, Jill's project um, and uh, with colleagues as well. Um, I think it's fair to say, Jill, you kept us on our toes through the, uh, through, through the uh, first part of the year in, in the, some of the data requests as well. Um, but it was really a kind of that COVID community project was a really sort of exciting, locally based Glasgow linkage that was linking lots and lots of different data sets, um, the COVID testing data as well, um, in a way that the Safe Haven hadn't really done before. Traditionally, we've been mostly involved in retrospective studies, and all of a sudden, um, we had to think on our feet and try and support much, much lower latency data projects. Um, there's a bit of a trend right now, we can cover it in the Q&A if we want to, but towards actual live public health surveillance of ongoing public health issues. Um, we're hosting um, the uh, EVADE study with Professor Thompson, and that's looking at you know, variant escape, but there's a number of other surveillance type studies like the Charisma Project as well, and I think that really represents, in the course of this year, we really started trying to move much, much closer to what's happening week by week, month by month in the Glasgow population, which is something quite different. Um, and it's quite a challenge, but it also offers really interesting research opportunities as well. Um, we've... We've done a real mix this year. We do um, projects with structured data. So like that, you know, like the um, flat files that we showed you, uh, health record data. Um, we've also been involved in imaging projects that are happening outside of the eye care program as well. So I think it is important to emphasize that we do within NHS GGC have an imaging research um, uh, team as well, so we can support imaging projects outside of ICAD um, and, and the SHAPE program. Um, and uh, we've got one hosted at the moment um, with quite a few interesting MRI images and analysis is happening with those um, right now. Um, and we've also been moving a little bit into um, NLP free text. A lot of records have free text, but um, there's a couple of interesting projects that are actually uh, focused almost exclusively on. Um, uh, text um, written by clinicians, um, assessments of patients and that sort of thing. And again, that's something a little bit different that Safe Haven you know, hasn't really been um, working with um, before. So we're always open to new ideas. Um, there's, there's projects now that, you know, involving video 
as well so it's a changing area so if there's if there's um, any data out there we will consider linking to it and i think over the next few years the big stuff is really going to be omic sequencing data linking that to, to, to some of the traditional clinical data as well so just during the course of the year i really won't go into you know too much detail with these but you know if people want to find out about them they can contact us uh, you know we can put you in contact with the research teams as well um, like i say getting um, and linking to covid test data for the glasgow population was one of the big challenges early on in the pandemic um, we were having we had local testing that was happening that we could see in sky store and then as the pandemic progressed, uh, we then received in Glasgow a feed of all of the lighthouse data and the national testing as well. So that really drove a number of projects. Um, uh, Kevin will speak about um, Asterix, you know, community COVID. We had a whole set of COVID related projects, some very, very small, just looking at a few uh, you know, very small populations, some looking across the whole of the Glasgow population as well. So I think that's something that I put into the chat. I really want to emphasize the safe haven can host big, big, big projects, but also we want to support small innovative projects as well, innovative data linkages. And as Jill alluded to, it'd be great to get more students in there as well, because what we really struggle with is um, upskilling researchers, um, data managers, technicians in how to handle health data. Um, so, um, yeah, if there are more educational opportunities, we're ready to, 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 to support those as well. Um, I've put a mention here of another project which I, I, I found really, really interesting. Um, this is um, uh, linking to data from um, a hospice in Paisley. So it's not a massive project, you know, but, but they were looking at um, end of life care for a cohort of about 3,000 patients um, uh, that, that, that are just geographically located in and around um, Paisley. And what they're doing is linking some of the local hospice data to some of our safe haven data, and then also to data from um, Public Health Scotland as well. So things like um, out of hours calls, emergency calls that we can't really see, you know, just in, in the health board, but we can request it from um, public health. And we're working with a Public Health Scotland analyst as well to link up all of this data. Um, and I just feel like that's a sort of a, a, a nice example of collaboration across different areas to try and answer um, questions that yeah, it's really difficult to answer questions about, you know, what, what happened to these people in the end of life, unless you, you link across um, different specialities. Um, I've mentioned a um, project here that's, that's being hosted at the RCB, um, catastrophic CV. So um, that's looking at um, cardiovascular disease risks, um, and it's a pretty big cohort. So um, that one's sitting at yeah, nearly 700,000 um, people in the Glasgow population. Um, we've linked it to some of the SMR data sets, some of the pharmacy data sets as well. Um, but it's, it's being able to support projects at that scale that, that really um, is a selling point for Glasgow. Um, as David said, you know, um, some projects are looking to kind of like link, link out, you know, they want to look at the whole Scottish population. They want to maybe look at applying it to the whole UK population. But um, I personally feel like Glasgow is a great place to test ideas, test algorithms, um, do um, data research that you might want to apply further out and further afield as well. So um, cohorts like catastrophic CV, big cohorts, lots of data, um, and, and you can really, really get stuck into stuff like that. Um, the, the, uh, another project that's using the um, unscheduled care data set that David uh, mentioned, um, was with an organization um, called Health Navigators. Um, and um, again, um, interesting applications of data to try and solve clinical problems. So um, this project was looking at um, predictive models for um, what happens when somebody comes um, to A&E, um, do they come back again? 
um, can we predict when people are going to come back? Um, are there patterns in um, that kind of healthcare usage? And as we're moving into you know flu season right now, um, we're seeing increasing demands at the hospital. I really, really think that using data, safe haven data, health data to think about these sorts of problems um, is, yeah, it, it, it is an imperative, really. Um, David also alluded to um, another data set that we've been um, working on. So this is um, looking at um, osteoporosis, and we ran um, an SBRI in collaboration with colleagues uh, in the innovation team here at the health board. Um, so R and I have an innovation team. Um, they work with um, industry, they work with clinicians, and they're really looking at kind of novel applications, looking at um, improving clinical pathways, uh, perhaps using um, devices or new technology to improve care as well. So this was an interesting project. Um, three industry partners looking at streamlining um, uh, the, the, the work, the fracture liaison service here in, in, in Glasgow. So we've got this real mix here of, you know, academic projects, clinical projects, industry projects as well. So, you know, we're able to support all sorts of stuff here in the safe haven. Um, and just put at the end there, another project, um, Steata site, um, safe haven team, a bit of work into it in 2020. Um, I think it's fair to say it was a project that was trying to link data from different safe havens and um, build a merged data set looking at um, fatty liver disease. Um, and it had become a little bit stuck, but I think um, certainly in Glasgow, we tried our best to kind of help reinitiate that project, get it moving. And um, Seattle site is really you know, um, proved to be a great success. They've actually managed to get data from um, different parts of Scotland and bring it together into a merged data set that'll form a great resource for a particular disease. Um, and this is something that we're seeing for a number of different project ideas, um, you know, themed data sets, themed data sets around particular conditions. So certainly if um, you're out there and you're sitting in the Institute and you're thinking, gosh, it'd be great to have, you know, a big data set around this theme. Um, we're certainly open to ideas around data linkages and hosting data sets around particular themes, a little bit like Steata site. Um, and again, there are big projects in the pipeline. David mentioned strength in places. You know, there is um, money and resource being put into Glasgow that's going to be using the expertise at the RCB and, and, and the university to really deliver interesting thematic data sets. Um, and just at the ends here, um, I, I realize most of the audience here is probably um, academic or um, uh, NHS, but we've also um, been doing a little bit of work with um, commercial partners as well and industry partners. Um, we deployed an instance of um, a tool that's called Trinetics. Trinetics are a big data company that specialize in supporting recruitment for clinical trials. So we're hosting a blob of about a million patient records um, in, a, in a way secure, anonymized, that allows um, us to generate aggregate um, data on conditions, um, on tests that people have had. So that's you know, a way of supporting data-driven clinical trial planning and recruitment. Um, it relates to CTU function and it relates to um, national discussions at the moment around how do we use better data better to support what's quite an, a, a big area in Glasgow and Scotland, which is, is, is clinical trials. Um, Safe Haven has done a lot of work as part of the eye care program. Um, we are the ones that build the cohorts and we are the ones that supply all of the structured data for ingestion onto the platform. So um, we have to work very, very closely with the eye care program. They do the imaging bit, but we've done all of the structured health record data delivery. Um, we've done validation of the anonymization of imaging data. And um, we're the ones who are writing all of the SOPs and doing all the validation for the pseudonymization technology as well. So. Um, that's in partnership with Grampian as well. Um, so personally, I think it's important to sort of build relationships with other universities 
um, other safe havens as well. Um, and that's definitely something in the plan for this um, next 12 months is, is, is more around federation, data discovery across all of Scotland, all of the locations that, that are providing data research support. Um, also been working very close as part of IK with Canon Medical Systems. They are building the Safe Haven AI platform as part of iCare. Interesting technology, um, not without its problems and challenges um, in terms of development, um, but it is something that's on the you know, horizon as a, as a tool for sort of supporting AI. Um, but it's just another place where you can do data work, data research. But the RCB has got all of the tools, lots of the compute, it's got some shiny GPUs as well. So you can do an awful lot of work with data that we can provide and they can host there as well. So that's definitely, you know, think broadly, we've got different environments that we can support work. Um, we've also um, just finally here, um, we've done um, projects with um, big data company down, um, uh, down south, Sensine Health. Um, and um, it's interesting working with, you know, commercial companies, um, doing the LPAC approvals for those. As Malcolm said, the approval process, you know, they, they certainly come under a lot more scrutiny, um, but it's been just interesting working with data scientists and commercial companies. Um, and these projects have all been hosted securely at the RCB as well. So all of the kit, all of the compu, all of the environment they're providing has satisfied the needs of some pretty big, you know, companies and, and, and big teams of data scientists as well. So again, I think that's a testament to the service that the Robertson can provide um, as well. Um, and as David has mentioned, um, one last company, you know, the health board is working quite a bit with is Storm ID. Um, and again, I'd say for bigger projects, it's becoming, it's not uncommon now to bring in, you know, a commercial company development company, maybe a company that might specialize in other analysis that might support um, your data project. So um, yeah, if you're thinking of big bids, um, you know, complex projects, um, it's really just to emphasize that we can support and, and provide governance routes to um, allow sometimes commercial companies to get in and, and, and securely do bits of data work for you to support projects as well. Um, and I think that's important for Scotland. Uh, and I think it's important for the university to kind of build these collaborations in Glasgow that really make Glasgow a good place to work um, with, with health data. Um, and really that's all I wanted to say about this year. It's been a funny sort of year. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of activity in 2021 as well, which I'm sure Alan and the RCB, uh, <laughs> they know all about as well, but um, yeah, anybody's got any questions, um, we'll, we'll, we'll pick them up at the end in the Q&A section. But otherwise, um, Sandosh, that's, that's me for now, okay. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I think the next uh, talk is by me. <clears throat> There's going to be a so I'm going a small uh, a short talk about uh, the University of Glasgow uh, perspective. So we all have heard um, the exponential growth in health data. We know that health data is driving a lot of novel research, and we heard from Charlie and uh, David uh, the 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 scale of the projects that are currently being undertaken in the safe haven. So this is Glasgow and, and, and we have a unique opportunity here with a huge amount of uh, data. And Charlie mentioned, it's a, not just uh, large ambitious projects, it's also small projects. The university uh, is, has recognized the value of health data in research. And, they, and, and also they have realized uh, the value of uh, compute infrastructure. So there's a huge investment uh, made by the university, or is being made by the university to develop uh, the university's compute, uh, rather MVLSS compute capabilities. Um, so in parallel, building the infrastructure is good, but we also need analysts to drive the analysis and to convert data into actionable 
research or actionable findings. And, and we do have a problem there because we need to build a critical mass of data scientists. We have, we have the talent, we have the uh, expertise, but what we don't have is a pipeline to bring this critical mass of data scientists who can work on safe haven data. Data is growing uh, we, we, and the scale and scope of data are increasing day by day. So we need to have the workforce to, to capitalize on this. And, and one strategy we are scoping out is the Ogre Initiative, which is uh, essentially a collaboration between the University of Glasgow and Safe Haven to get, um, to pro to, to get uh, an environment where we can increase or enhance training of a range of researchers, and also an environment where we could conduct small studies for clinicians wherein the university provides analytical expertise. Um, so there are clinicians who may have small questions. They may consider it small, but they're clinically very important. And these are, these are research questions that need to be published. And, and these are research questions that we need to show that in Glasgow, we are capable of answering these questions and they may have uh, impact on health policy or guidelines. So we need to get those into the public domain, into publications. And the bottleneck there is uh, analysts, analytical, not the hardware, but human resources. So we have, we are, we are scoping this out. Uh, the ogre means, I'm not sure, can you see my screen? Yeah. See, ogre is the, uh, the UOG, University of Glasgow, GGC, Trusted Research Environment. And I think uh, we will we will try and <laughs> explain. Uh, so 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 we're just coping out. So we are hoping to give more details in due course. So watch this space. In due course, we will um, we are creating a, a a plan for how to make this happen. Um, once the compute infrastructure is in place in, in the ice building, we have more computing resources, and hopefully, we should be able to. Uh, run uh, what we envisage running about 20 projects within a six month period, which will all end up in publications, smaller, large publications in either in preprint or formally peer reviewed publications. So I'll, I'll end there and uh, I'll, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Uh, we can move on to the next. I'm not sure if Kevin has logged in yet. I can't see him on the list. So the next talk is by Kevin Blythe on, uh, on the Asterix project. Uh, so I don't see Kevin here. So shall we go on with the Q&A and take Kevin's, um, and do Kevin's lecture once he logs in? I think he has said he'll log in at three o'clock. So we're yeah, I, think, I think he's clinical, Sandor. So um, yeah, he, he may come in at the last minute. So um, if, if you're happy, we can do a bit of question and answer. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah. So if anybody has questions, please uh, either add it to the chat or raise your hands. Uh, before that, again, to repeat, um, we will circulate slides of the meetings to all participants. There will also be a link to recordings available for people to view this. Uh, Charlie has posted links for uh, describing the safe haven data sets and FAQs. All those will be shared. Uh, so. So don't worry about uh, taking notes. Uh, you, you will get all that information in due course. Yeah, I think um, costs is something that comes up, you know, quite early on. Um, Sandosh, so um, I think I put into the chat earlier on, basically the safe, each of the safe havens is funded with CSO money. And then um, each of the safe havens then um, cost recovers for individual projects. Um, and as sort of alluded to, um, we 
try not to make sort of costs a kind of a barrier to um, doing a project. So for um, yeah, GGC clinicians, if you're doing a sort of fairly small scale project or if it's something fairly novel, um, as far as possible, we'll try and waive um, any fees for extraction. Um, it's really on a sort of a case by case basis, but for example, we've initiated like a pretty large diabetes data set project in the last few months. And for that one, we're just absorbing the cost with our CSO money because we don't have that many diabetes projects in our portfolio. So the hope is, is that, you know, it's a good idea, it's a good data set, and hopefully it will drive um, more research um, and develop more expertise in say, for example, using Sky Diabetes um, data. Um, but for bigger studies, bigger trials, yeah, if you're bidding for lots of money and it's 100,000, you know, three, three million pounds or something like that, and it's a very complex project, then yeah, the, the, the scales for extraction of data and hosting of data and storage and analysis and stuff will increase. But um, I think in the last year, I think we've, we've topped out at something like um, 15K or something like that for an extract. But yeah, you'd have to have a very, very complicated project to sort of push us even higher than that. But yeah, but that's pretty much it for costs. Um, but if you want to, if you've got an idea for a project, we will talk about that in pre-engagement with, with people that are interested in doing safe haven projects. Yeah, yeah. Um, John, you've got your hand up. Yeah. How high did you say you had to, You was your most expensive project? Uh, I, 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 um, I think I'll I, I can show you at the end, John. But uh, yeah, I think yeah. we've got I think we've got up. We ha we haven't got over twenty for anything before. Yeah. Okay, well that, that's good to know. Um, I was just wondering if you could sort of clarify where we are with the West of Scotland project as opposed to the Glasgow project, and uh, yeah. how, how easy or hard is it to pull in those additional data sets from other health boards? So we um, contacted all of the guardians and information governance leads at each of the West of Scotland health boards. So that's uh, Forth Valley, Lanarkshire, and the other two as well. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Leafshire and, and they, Exactly, yeah, yeah. And, and they all- in Galloway, I think. That's it, that's it. And they all renewed um, their commitment that if there are data projects that want to do linkage with their data, they're happy with that and they, simply ask that if there is a request to do a data linkage with that, with their data, that they are notified through the LPAC. Um, where we've become a bit stuck is actually getting the data from Public Health Scotland. So getting them to provide, for example, SMR sets for each of the West of Scotland regions. Um, and the, the, the governance around it, we come into conflict with Idris and national projects because they generally push you towards going to PBPP approval if you're going to begin doing linkages with uh, multiple health boards so it's definitely a sort of watch this space but i have i've been emailed this morning by fourth um, valley um, on that very topic so just looking for confirmation that if we were to want to do data linkages here in the west of scotland is that um, are we going to support that um, so um, yeah, it's and, it, it's possible, um, but I, I would say there are caveats if you really want to do a project across yeah. all the west of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in terms of uh, data sets of interest, the uh, the prescribing data set, of course, comes from the national data set, so it suffers from the same issues as SMR one. But the uh, lab data, the lab data is all local data. Uh, have we got as far as uh, merging? lab data or obtaining lab data uh, there's work that's been happening in dundee looking at trying to acquire well actually map lab data from the main safe havens um, but basically you would be looking at custom extracts from each health board for the laboratory data and from experience different health boards particularly the smaller ones it's down to the technical support and te uh, technical um, expertise that they have locally to support an so the answer is proceed data. with caution <laughs> Uh, yes, don't plan a project, you know, where, where that's a dependency. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and then something that was right at the beginning of the chat was, uh, um, you know, bringing in social care data sets, uh, you know, particularly 
with the welcome initiative on uh, multimorbidity, uh, um, getting information in terms of uh, uh, the address of the patient. And by address, I mean, were they admitted to a care home? Uh, uh, did they, um, yeah, well, that would be the principal one. Um, but obviously it'd be very useful to have other social care data sets, but I guess the big one, the big expense is uh, in the care home. Yeah, and, and I mean, in the chat, somebody's asked about future plans for general practice, alcohol and drug recovery, social benefits, housing and things like that. And that's something that um, personally, I would, you know, it, it's been something that I'm pursuing with Glasgow City Council. So trying to build productive working relationships, which will allow us to do data linkage with some of the more um, social related data sets. Um, so um, alcohol and drug recovery services, um, yes. Um, there's um, also um, chat at the moment about uh, links to sexual health services. So Sandiford Clinic, um, there's housing data that's available, so council tax data um, available at the, at the council, which the council holds, which we were discussing only this week, um, how linkage might work for that. Um, and some of us have worked with um, prison data as well. Um, Emily Tweed has worked with um, a prison data set. And like I said, we've had access to police data um, in the last uh, few months as well. So it is an area, I think, of growth but there are certain obstacles and problems. Um, and there's a, there's a, a pretty substantial um, NIHR project, again, being led by Emily Tweed, that's looking at, you know, what are the barriers to linkage to, say, social care data um, to other public sector sources of data. But I think, I think we will make inroads in the next year. Yeah, definitely. Um, just keeping it, I see... Um, Sandosh, I see yep. uh, Kevin. Kevin has joined us now, yep. so it's up to you. We can we can um, invite him to speak about Asterix now and then yep. wrap up. You know. yep. Thanks. So Kevin, yeah, Kevin is online. Uh, so Kevin, uh, could you, uh, yeah, well, welcome to the session. And your uh, talk is on Asterix. We look forward to hearing about it. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much, Sandosh, and thanks Charlie for the invitation. Um, Hi everyone, uh, I'm sorry I missed um, the earlier part of the, the workshop. Um, can I share slides from here? Okay. Is that sharing okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. So Charlie's and Sandosh have asked me to talk about Asterix, um, which I'm going to spend most of the next um, maybe 15 minutes just running through. Uh, I've got one slide at the end on, on uh, Getafix. Uh, so both of these um, studies are part of the uh, CSO funded um, COVID-19 portfolio um, that was um, awarded um, about, well, middle of last year, early last year as the pandemic hit. Um, so uh, I'll spend most of my time talking about Asterix. So, so Asterix is essentially a prospective cohort study that seeks to try and define endotypes uh, of COVID-19 that we could target in future clinical trials. Um, uh, the aim is uh, really just as I've said there, we had um, defined some um, fairly straightforward objectives and uh, uh, this was all done really as the pandemic hit, so really within the first few um, weeks and months of, of the pandemics uh, of last year. So uh, some of these are pretty basic, actually. So it was um, fundamentally to try and acquire and record some of the key biological data in patients coming in with COVID-19 within an environment, within a pandemic setting in the hospital. Uh, and so we were obviously relying um, and looking to Charlie and the team for some direct uh, capture of information from the electronic record. Uh, and with um, David Lowe primarily, uh, we'd uh, developed a bespoke data collection tool to actually embed collection of some key bedside information and other 
clinical data into the data set, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute, and we can, I can talk you through the issues that we had with that. Um, the aim was ultimately to develop um, traditional regression models um, for uh, the development of severe respiratory failure um, and death um, and COVID pneumonia. And then there was a very important other part of the study, which was to was to create a structured biobanking infrastructure so that we could collect um, uh, biological materials that we could use to power downstream uh, translational projects. And we explicitly focused on surplus biological materials, being very aware that within a pandemic, um, a bit like the data collection, uh, it had to be um, it had to be doable, um, you know, mandating lots of extra serum collection for a study um, was going to be a challenge. Um, so in terms of the groups of patients that we want to predict outcomes for, then we have essentially five severity groups, um, which are defined by really an admission to hospital, uh, and then an elevating um, severity of disease, which is defined really by the amount of oxygen you need on the ward uh, and those who need more than 60% oxygen or, or require CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure, which is what you would get if you come down to high dependency um, with your COVID um, and those requiring ventilation. And this is important because these... Um, endpoints define our groups of patients, but they, as we find out, are quite difficult to extract with routinely acquired data. And uh, the data that we've got from Safe Haven has been incredibly useful, but I think it's also important to highlight where the limits are on that and, and what you actually then need to do if you want to collect some of these, these data points. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. Um, our data sources, I'm sure you've discussed all of these uh, in the last couple of hours. Uh, ours are, are not, there's nothing exciting about ours relative to what you've already talked about. Um, a couple of things to highlight, obviously we had, we had funded the development of this COVID assessment tool, um, which uh, I think is on the next slide. So this is, it was with the day six team. So it's based on an SBAR format, which was designed, uh, it's deployable uh, through track care. Uh, and we'd uh, got a hold of a bunch of iPads to help clinical staff actually input this data. Um, the reality was that when we tried to deploy this, it was very, very difficult. The staff were just too busy. Um, it, it was difficult when we're not yet on electronic inpatient notes to convince busy staff to write in the notes and also um, input this data electronically. So we, we found really that we, we had a lot of this data missing. And this is important because I know some people in, in the meeting are planning to use this for other studies. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of engaging people to actually collect that data live and, and for it to be reliable. Uh, just to go back to this, um, we um, we obviously have, we, we also linked with the ICU data set from SIGSAG. Uh, and so that gives us, um, so that's a live audit um, tool uh, and gives you pretty reliable data on admission to ICU and HDU and days ventilated um, uh, and even days on non-invasive ventilation like CPAP. Um, but it still does leave us a gap for that kind of data for patients who are not in HDU or ICU, so the ward settings, and, and that is the vast majority of COVID cases. Um, so the, the key data fields that we were interested in terms of, of, of either um, baseline factors that we're really candidate predictors of outcome are here, um, some of these are obviously also um, outcome measures for the models. So uh, receipt of, of high flow oxygen or, or non-invasive ventilation is uh, one of the outcomes um, and receipt of invasive mechanical ventilation and ICU is the same. 
Um, we had to adapt a little bit as COVID therapies came online. And so we've added in things like receipt of steroids and um, uh, all the, I mean, these are all reasonably um, expected. Um, I've highlighted some, some data fields. I said at the start that, that, that we, we had hoped to collect as much as we'd hoped to combine direct extraction from the health record via Safe Haven with live inputting of data using the, the bedside app. And we, because the, the app was very difficult to, to deploy, um, uh, there are these fields that were highlighted became quite difficult to reliably collect on all patients. Um, some of these are pretty obvious and don't need any explanation. Um, proning, um, you may have um, heard of. Proning is basically lying patients on their tummy uh, or lying them on their side uh, when, they, when, they, when they're in the ward. Uh, and there is some at least observational data that that's a benefit in COVID. Um, duration of symptoms is very important for some of our therapies and some of our clinical decision making, um, and it's not easy to record, uh, uh, extract directly from the records. So um, what we've had to do essentially um, is based on this early review of the data we had from Asterix via purely safe haven extracts is we've had to supplement our data with with actually a team a large team of doctors collecting additional fields. So this slide shows uh, that if we look just at um, the safe haven data, we have a very large cohort of patients in green who are admitted to hospital and they are neither given CPAP or NIV or are in, um, in a critical care setting, but they are in the wards, but are broadly undifferentiated beyond that. And so we can't actually partition the groups into severity of lung injury. Uh, and therefore that has a major impact, not just in the model building, but it has a major impact in the translational um, use of samples because we can't uh, really describe or partition samples into severity of disease, for example, a downstream project looking at baseline predictors of um, severe lung injury. So we, what we have had to do, we've collected or created two groups of, of ward doctors of about 20 doctors each um, who have been given a list of, we've essentially given them lists of about 100 cases um, to actually go into clinical portal and extract about 10 data items for each of their 100 patients to give us more information for, for what amounts to about um, 4,000 patients. Um, uh, so at the moment, the, the cohort has, uh, amounts to about 8,000 um, COVID-19 uh, patients in, in GGC. Um, there's been a very large uh, effort in terms of coordinating blood, so respiratory secretions and urine in those cases, both at QE and GRI. In the downstream laboratory projects, we've organized those cases into tiers. Uh, and those are, the tiering is dependent on what um, the numbers of samples we have essentially and the kind of samples we have. The highest value sample, the highest value tier are patients in whom we've got serum, plasma, and a buffy coat at baseline. Uh, and we've got over a thousand of those. Uh, and about 400 of those have got their first sample within 72 hours. So this is a large bioresource that's currently being mined for um, various different uh, markers. Um, the, this is, um, data that Claire Orange has put together and, and um, has been prepared for publication, but it kind of illustrates the, the impact that um, COVID has had on biobanking and um, really what much of that in Glasgow has actually been driven through the Asterix pipeline. So you can see over the, the two years preceding the, the pandemic that the biobanking efforts um, in Glasgow were primarily around fresh tissue. 
and then you can see in the time following that that, that there's been a, just an enormous upscaling of blood sample collection. Uh, and not all of that is, is for, uh, certainly no means by all of that is asterisks, but certainly our project um, uh, it, it certainly collected a large volume of samples over that time period. Um, I mentioned the tiers. Um, this is really just how we've we've organised things in, uh, in terms of the biobanking and asterisks. Um, the other th the point to make, I think here, I've kind of already said to you really what the, the different tiers are, um, where we've got tier three are, are, are very high value cases that we'd want to be doing multiple layers of omics. So we'll, at the moment we're doing epigenomics and proteomics, for example, uh, in tier three samples. And then we can add in other layers of, of biological information. Uh, the, the, the point really to make on this slide is that there's quite a lot of, um, data cleaning that needs done, um, even around the entry, which is tier zero, which is um, defining somebody who's come into hospital with COVID. That would seem to be an obvious thing, but it's not really because it relies for, on us having reliable coding in SMR01, and these are the codes that are used for COVID admissions. But then there are patients who have a don't have that code. Uh, they have another code, which might be a code that says pneumonia or chest infection. Um, and those cases need to be cleaned uh, and, uh, and cross-referenced to a PCR result because a large proportion of those patients will be um, COVID admissions. They will have had a PCR within 28 days of that admission. And if they have an appropriate code and an appropriate um, admission, then we would include them in the cohort but that's not something that comes necessarily automatically through the, um, in the data set that, we've, that, we, that we get. Um, in terms of the access process, it also requires a fair amount of effort it is, to, is to manage the downstream pipeline for investigators. So we've got, um, I think there are the six projects here that are kind of running that are using asterisk materials, and you can see roughly where they're coming from. A large proportion are, are collaborators from our own institutions. Uh, the proteomic work is, work is with Tony Wetton in, uh, in Manchester. And there are all of these steps that need done, um, uh, which involve some discussion up front. Um, applications are made through the, the, the biorepository portal um, before we get to that stage, there needs to be a, an agreement actually that the outcome exists in the data set. So we did, for example, have a project that was interested in looking at microRNAs from predicting adverse cardiovascular outcomes from COVID. But when we looked into the data set, there really weren't many MIs and strokes driven by COVID. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. Uh, this was all learning through the pandemic. Uh, and then there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of uh, the approvals in terms of uh, data transfer agreements, et cetera, and then generation of pick lists and, and sample transport. And uh, that's just a kind of overview of the things that are happening at the moment. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're just kind of really working hard to do that retrospective collection of missing data items and asterisks that I mentioned, because, and it's really these bedside observations around what was your maximum oxygen dose? Um, did you get CPAP? Did you get other therapies where you pruned? Uh, and then that'll help us. We will then be able to do the, the analyses, which will be initially agnostic, uh, and then we'll be more focused on endotypes that might be, we can relate to a mechanism, mechanism of action and maybe to the design of a future trial. Um, and we have a variety of, of collaborations and, and, and funding plans related to that. I want to just, if I've got two minutes, literally, it's just to, just to show this one slide around Getafix. So Getafix is another project within the CSO portfolio, um, and it is a randomized controlled trial of favipiravir, um, which is um, a genomic poison, essentially, um, which there is, was licensed in Japan for flu. Um, and Safe Haven is, has become a very important part in this study um, because 
uh, when we designed this study a year ago, uh, we didn't appreciate how difficult it was going to be to identify patients because the you know patients you this is a community study, so these are this is pre hospitalisation. We're trying to stop people coming into hospital. We need to randomise people within seven days of them getting symptoms, um, and of course patients are told to stay at home. They don't go and see their primary care provider. They don't come to hospital. Uh, and so we've it's taken a lot of effort to find a mechanism that allows us to um, to be in you know to have visibility in front of patients. And so we've got a website that patients can con can come to and self screen. Uh, but uh, via Caldecott approval, we're able to use board wide um, data on positive cases, which was then filtered through Charlie's team. Um, and then uh, the, our team of fellows then get that list uh, and we can um, make invitations to those patients either by email or by telephone. And so that kind of data-driven recruitment and kind of using data to help us recruit quickly into trials, I think is the other element that, that I'm sure you've maybe touched on to the earlier part of today, but it is a very important part of this study. Um, and I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any any questions. I hope that was useful. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, go back to question Q and A. Uh, any questions for Kevin or more generally questions about Safe Haven? There has been quite a few questions in the chat uh, or discussions on the chat. All right. Yeah, I think I think we've covered the questions in the chat, Sandosh. Yeah. And just um, to echo what Kevin said about like get a fix. I mean, that's that's quite sort of new territory. Sort of yeah, using sort of data data methods and the access we have to to some of the data to like streamline the recruitment process. And um, it's it's quite complicated, but it's there's like national discussions happening about how we use data to 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 make you know, improve the way we recruit and manage clinical trials and collect data for clinical trials as well. So it's an area, yeah, Safe Haven is just part of, yeah, sort of lots of different efforts to improve those processes. So it's quite, yeah, it's quite an interesting area in Glasgow. Certainly we're doing things in Glasgow that, yeah, um, the, the other health boards and other areas in Scotland aren't, yeah, aren't anywhere near what we're trying to do. So, yeah. I think it's it's good stuff, yeah. And I think I have to catch up with you, Kevin, about that probably tomorrow. Tomorrow, if we can, I'll respond yeah, yeah. to your email. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Good. Um, any more questions, Sandos? Do we think or? Um, I can't see any. Is there anybody? Um, yeah, John. Yeah, you know, just uh, just a thought uh, on that. Uh, identifying patients in the community. National Research Scotland has a uh, mechanism, you know, they'll go into primary care and identify, uh, admittedly, this is tends to be more for non-acute medicine, but identify patients uh, in the GP register and then send out letters on batch. And that's been quite successful for clinical trials like uh, the Pontiac 2 trial in diabetes and so on. We've uh, had a good response to that. Um, so, you know, that's another way of trying to potentially marry up the uh, um, the abilities of the safe haven, because you can still get all the GP blood tests, you can get all of the, uh, the prescribing, uh, and you can get all that information at the same time as, you know, you can contact the patients through primary care and, uh, yeah, build yeah, your that, cohort that way. That's certainly an option that we've provided as well at the safe haven. So we've we've built cohorts and then given um, shared the lists of Kai's with that that team, John. So then they're then able to make the contacts with the GP practices and to sort of streamline their processes as well. So yeah, I think sometimes just thinking a bit creatively about how we can use the data to support you know other teams, trial teams, primary care teams is yeah. Yeah, we're open, open to suggestions, let's just say. Yeah, yeah I, th I think the issue, um, John, with, with GetEffects is it's, I mean, it was, it's, it's been very interesting for me to do um, because it, it, 
the patients are not actually in anybody's system. You know, they're being managed by a text message and a, and a PCR result and told to stay at home. And, they, and they've got really minimal contact with, with any of us, primary care or secondary care. And so it's, I think without um, the data uh, and the support we've got from Safe Haven, I think we would really not be able to recruit to that. And, and the change, the difference that that has made has gone from no recruits effectively to, um, I think, we're running it between six and eight randomizations a week at the moment um, through that kind of data driven, you know, patient empowered to contact us via the website. That kind of mechanism has been really incredibly powerful. It's well, Sandosh, if there's if we don't have any other questions, I mean, it, I'd, I'd just like to thank everybody that's joined us um, today. It's been a really great turnout as well. and. Um, I think as safe haven, we, we, we really want to do a bit of comms over the next few months to really kind of promote what we do, the collaborations with the university, the services that the RCB offer as well. Um, because uh, I sometimes feel like we're a bit, we're, we're too quiet. We need to, um, yeah, let people know what data we've got available, the tools we've got available, the support we've got available as well, because it can be a real engine for, research and innovation and, and hopefully learning um, as well in collaboration with the university. So, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone. Sandosh. Thank you. Thank you all. Jill, do you have anything else? Any last comments? No, just thank you very much to um, Charlie and Sandosh for you know doing all of the um, preparatory work and organizing all the speakers and thanks to the individual speakers. It's been great. And hopefully you'll now be flooded with requests and hate you for ever suggesting that you should do this. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. All right. Well, thanks, thanks very much, everyone.